so today's lesson I have entitled Olympics, Horses, and Suffering. I'll bet you, you have never been to church. Strike that. I'll bet you, you've never been anywhere to listen to a lecture or sermon or class entitled Olympics, Horses, and Suffering. I dare say this may be your first. Now, what made me think of this was standing in a grocery store yesterday morning in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I was there and I looked at uh, all of the little magazines while you're waiting for the person in front of you to finish so you can check out. And They've got all of those magazines trying to get your attention. I was not as concerned about which royal was, was saying what about what royal or which this or that uh, movie stars with that one and are J-Lo and Ben going to make it this time and all the rest. I didn't pull those down, but I did find one that had puzzles on it. And that just stokes my engine. So I got the puzzle book. And they had connect the dots. You ever do connect the dots? Some of them are pretty easy, aren't they? I mean, you can look at that one, and you don't have to sit there and draw the whole thing out to figure out you got a rocket ship, right? I mean, come on now, this one's not that hard, is it? I mean, you can kind of draw the stuff and connect all the dots, but you're still sort of getting it anyway, right? Some of them are a little more difficult. Now, you'll still get it. It's not that hard. You can connect those dots and figure out it's a bunny rabbit. But I got news for you. Have you ever tried to identify the constellations in the sky? Okay, that's not easy. Okay, Janet, you can probably do that because you're a stargazer. She's waiting for the UFOs to come back. But for the rest of us, I mean, okay, fine. There. That's Taurus the bull? Now who was drinking what when they came up with that? I mean, look, I can get a telescope out and I can see the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper. But who on earth decided that you connect the dots and that becomes a bear? That's a dipper. It's not a bear. Somebody's connecting the dots. So that's my inspiration for Olympics, horses, and suffering. We're going to connect the dots. And the dots are Philippians 1.27, Philippians 1.28, and Philippians 1.29. When you connect them all together, you got Olympics, horses, and suffering. Are you ready? Let's start with Philippians 1.27. This is Olympics. But it takes us a minute to get there. Paul writes, only... Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, if you were reading this or hearing this in Greek, you would be struck by the first word that he's got here, Monon word, think of that's M O N O N. The ends, the new, looks like a V. So don't say Mavov, that might work in Lubbock, but among Greek speakers it doesn't work. That's M O N O. Now, what is mono? One. Like you got stereo. You got mono, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, mononucleosis, if we have doctors in here, can talk about the one cell. Yeah, that's the kissing disease, Miss Carolyn. Uh, Miss Carolyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you too. Be careful over there with Hank. All right. Only, only. So this is this, is this idea, monos. Only. Just one thing. Paul says, I want to tell you just one thing. One thing. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
If I had Oliver here, I would ask Oliver, what does Paul mean when he uses the word gospel? And Oliver would tell us the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's Paul's gospel. That's the good news. That's the good news. So Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel. Paul saw all of life through the prism of the death of Christ. So just as a prism will take a light beam and divide it into the various frequencies that show us different colors, so Paul's view of life was always through the spectrum, the prism of the gospel, the death of Christ. And that's how he saw all of life. Now, when you, when you hear this, you might be thinking, okay, so that's Paul's unique view. And it is. I mean, Paul made it so clear when he wrote the Corinthians and said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But a lot of people may ask legitimately this question. What does that mean? What does it mean to see all of life? through the prism of the gospel. What does it mean to say, live a life worthy of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ? What exactly does that look like? Well, that's what Paul's going to explain over the next, basically, 20 verses or so. So Paul is, is in a sense, right here, writing a theme statement for what he's going to be telling us he's going to get very practical here but the practicality is not a list of do's and don'ts so that God will smile at you the practicality is not framed by do this to get God's attention the practicality is framed by do this to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and this is Paul's theme statement. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's the one thing. Only. Let your manner of life be worthy. Now, look at the Greek for a moment. We've got monon up there. And then the very next phrase is axios tu euangeliu tu Christu. You've got that immediately following. That's down here in the English. Only worthy of the gospel of Christ is next in the Greek. Then we take the verb and we bump it up in the English because we don't typically put verbs at the end of a sentence. They do in Latin. Greek, you don't have to put the verb at the end of the sentence. Paul chose to. Worthy of the gospel of Christ is the next phrase. Oxios means in a manner that's worthy or that's suitable for the gospel of Christ. So Paul, this is what he's saying. I see all of life through the prism of the death of Christ. But when he says to live your life in a manner suitably... What Paul's just done is, is let us know that there are ethical implications of the gospel. The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ has ethical content. This is um, one of my favorite Christian thinkers and writers. is a fellow named Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. And Tom does a really good job at emphasizing the ethical content of the gospel. And, and, and I, I, I word things and see things a bit differently than Tom on some other aspects of the gospel. But on this, I think he does a masterful job of drawing our attention to the ethical content of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It changes how we live. Should changes who we are 
So I want to do something a little bit different here. I want to put the Greek back and the English back up here, but you'll see I've put them in two columns because I've got us a little scratch pad going over here. And this is how I'll work through it myself when I'm translating. I'll keep a little scratch pad going where I kind of keep track of my thoughts. So let's keep track of this together. Only is the way it starts out. Get that up there. Just one thing. Monon. Just one thing. And then Paul says the following. He says, in a manner suitable for the gospel of Christ, he wants us to live. Okay? So you got it? This is the order in which Paul's ordering things. Just one thing. In a manner suitable for the gospel of Christ, live. Now, live is an interesting word here. And if you listen to my video thoughts for the day this week, you'll, you'll see that I talked about this word once, or you will have heard it. But normally when Paul talks about the way we live, he uses a Greek verb, peripateo, which just means to walk. It's, it's a very Jewish expression, to walk about, to, 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 to walk out, to, to uh, uh, live the way you, you, you need to live. That's his normal word. This is a very, very rare word in Scripture. This word is, is um, palatuomai. Palatuomai. The Greek word polis, the, the beginning of that, means city. Like uh, metropolis is the metro city. Okay, polis means city. The police are the people who patrol the city. Polis is the Greek word for city. Polituomai is a Greek word that means to be a citizen. It can mean to have a home because you couldn't be a citizen if you didn't have a home. Uh, they were homeowners, landowners. But to be a citizen is the core idea here. So Paul doesn't use his normal word for let your manner of life be. He's using a word that says act like a responsible citizen. Live as a citizen. And it's in the, uh, it, Greek's got a form called the middle. And, and when it's in the middle, it means to, to do it in a sense to yourself kind of thing. What, what it means here in this form is conduct your life like a citizen. So what Paul is saying here is conduct your life like a citizen. A citizen who's living suitably in response to the gospel of Christ. A, a, a citizen who's living responsibly to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if I put it back on my scratch pad, just one thing, Paul says. Live like a citizen in a manner that's suitable for citizenship in the gospel of Christ. You've got citizenship. Now if you go back to the very first lesson we did in this series, I talked about how Philippi was a, a, a city that was, was kind of a good guard post for some silver and gold mines that were nearby. And as a result, for hundreds of years, it had been a treasured place, bad pun. And, and, and it took its name after Philippi, Philip, King Philip of Macedon, who was Alexander the Great's father. Hence, Philippi. But by the time you get to 42 BC, so Philip II names it after him back in the 350s, by the time you get to 42 B.C., there's a big Roman battle there. That big Roman battle was celebrated and marked in coins. It was the Battle of Philippi. You had Antony and Octavius on one side fighting against Brutus and Gaius on the other. And this was who was going to take over after Julius Caesar's execution or... or whatever you call it, assassination. Brutus loses. Gaius loses. Antony and Octavius win. Octavius changes his name to Augustus Caesar and reigns for the next 40 years. 
he is reigning when Jesus is born. Luke says, in the days of Augustus Caesar. That's Octavius. So when they won that battle, they commemorated it by making Philippi a Roman colony. Now understand what, what the, the, the Battle of Philippi was there. Boom, boom, boom. Let me get that slide out of the way. Uh, it's ba 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 ba. So by the time Paul comes, Philippi is a Roman colony. Now when Rome would conquer lands, generally they'd let the lands self-govern. You can take care of yourself as long as you pay me our taxes and you keep the peace. Acknowledge that we're your overlords and we'll let you do what you want within reason. That's the way, that's why uh, uh, in Judea, you've got the high priest and, and the Sanhedrin ruling over the Jews. You can do what you want as long as you keep the peace and you pay your taxes and you don't foment sedition. But there were a few places where Rome said, I'm making you a colony. That means you're governed by Roman law. That means Rome will be the police. That means Rome will be the currency. That means Rome will be the legal structure. You are a Roman colony. You are a Roman outpost. That's what Philippi was. And they were proud of it. That's a big deal. <clears throat> That came with great opportunities. So you've got this city that understands what it is to be a citizen in a unique way in the Roman Empire. And Paul's writing to them. And Paul says, you need to live like a citizen, but not a citizen of Rome. You need to live like a citizen of, of a, a different colony. You need to think of yourself as the, the church, a kingdom of God's colony. This is God's kingdom outpost. And so live like a citizen within God's kingdom outpost. Now, citizenship has rights and responsibilities. When you're a citizen, you have rights. You also have responsibilities. And that's what Paul's talking about here. So Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy, live like a citizen, worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you, or whether I'm absent, I'll hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit. Now, this is an interesting idea because you read this stakete it's a, a, a you present tense standing um, sto stare is standing in Latin they got to be related but this is standing standing in one henny spirit. That's um, I don't. I, there's a, there are two camps here on this. One camp says that that's the spirit in the sense of um, lowercase s. That's what the English Standard Version is put up there. Lowercase s. It's the idea of of maybe one. Um, the, the, the French have this expression, uh, esprit de corps, the spirit of the body, you know. Uh, um, it's this like pep rally, rah, rah, spirit. The problem is that's never used that way in the Greek. Uh, it, it would be a brand new usage. We don't find it anywhere in the Greek in, in Paul or before. This idea of, of spirit in that sense, pneuma, the word for spirit, uh, is, is not really used as a metaphor for camaraderie uh, 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 type stuff. You know, we have spirit-filled pep rallies today. We use it today that way. It's easy to read it that way. Not so then. So some other scholars who do the lower S spirit 
um, will say, well, it's talking about using in one spiritual gifting, you know, that, that, that everybody has a spiritual gift. And it's the, I tend to side with the scholars like Gordon Fee and others who say that we really ought to capitalize this. That Paul's saying in one spirit in the sense of the unity of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, your Greeks, done, uh, some of the Greek copies that we have would be uncils where everything's capitalized, but most of the, the Greek would not have any capitalization at all for Holy Spirit. That's an English convention. So you don't get that in the, the Greek. But Paul's saying standing firm in one spirit, that's an idea that he talks about in Ephesians and other places using very similar language about there is one spirit in which we dwell. That's God's spirit. Now he does say with one mind, using a different word for one and using suke for mind. Mia suke, or a different form I should say, of one. But that, that's, that's, that's a whole subject so he, he's got the idea of us working together but he's rooting it in the fact that we are of one spirit there is one God whom we worship who indwells us and we need to act like it unity koinonia is powerful when we're one it's powerful when the church is someone who breaks down barriers, we're powerful. When we've got people of all races joining hands in true fellowship and love, we're powerful. When we've got people of all ages joining hands in love, we're powerful. When we've got people of all socioeconomic classes joining hands, we're powerful. When we've got people of all different nations gathering together, we're powerful. The church should be the most clearly united organization this world has ever seen. There's no question. And Jesus is about to die. And his final prayers before he's arrested include this. Lord, I don't ask for these only, his followers right there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said a prayer for you and me before he died that we may all be one just as you father are in me and I in you that they may also be in us so that the world might believe that you've sent me it is a stunning testimony to the world when God's people are known for loving each other regardless of the things that divide in this world that's a powerful message. And that's why the enemy so hard wants the church to be known as people who hate. Or people who are exclusive. Or people who are holier than thou. But we need to tell the, 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 the enemy he's wrong. We need to live like citizens of the gospel. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And Paul says, so, so see, I want to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. Ah, you got a little word there. Here it is. Sunath luntes. Now, let's put that up there and break it apart. It's a compound word. Soon means with. Take that off for a moment to try to look at the rest of it. With plus Olympics. Not really, but sort of. Um, A-T-H-L 
And in its root form, you've got an E. We get the word athlete from it. And when you put athlete with soon, with, you've got a team sport. In a very real sense, a soon athleto means wrestle with, contend for a prize with, fight with, as in somebody on your team. Together we'll wrestle. Together, it's like tag team wrestling. You all watch that on TV or am I the only one? <laughs> love that tag team wrestling. I love the way they stomp. And bounce off the ropes. And whisper to each other what they're going to do next so that they don't really get hurt. <laughs> love that professional wrestling. I think it's real. Um, <laughs> but it's team wrestling or contending for a prize a relay race or basketball so I was talking to Drayton McLean one time Drayton used to own the rock uh, the Astros and uh, uh, he was telling me a story David you're a big baseball fan you'll like this story he was coach you'll like this story so yeah I'm doing okay time wise time out for a story so when Drake McLean first bought the Astros, he went to training camp. And um, I'm trying to remember who the coach was at the time. It may have been Phil Garner. I'm not sure who it was. But Drayton said to the coach, hey, um, before the team goes out there while they're in the, the, the dug, or dressing room, before they go out into the dugout, uh, I'd like to address them as the new owner. The coach said, uh... You know, I don't, I don't really know that that's a great idea. You know, it's not generally done. He says, look, I just would like to do this. Uh, you know, I, this means a lot to me. I bought this team. I'd like, to, I'd like to sort of give the players a little pep talk. Coach said, well, I work for you. Come on. So Drayton says, I went into the locker room, and I said to him, you know, and, and, and he said, I, I, I channeled my best high school baseball coach and and." And, and, and I just said to him, you know, we're the Houston Astros. We're going to be great. We're going to pull together as a team. We're going to bring this city what it needs. We're going to support each other. We're going to be there. And he said, Mark, I was talking to him, and I could tell it was going nowhere. They weren't paying attention. They didn't care. And so I just kind of ended it. I said, okay, let's get out there and, and, and be an Astro. And he said, and they went out there and they played. And I, and I thought about it. And I thought, you know, I don't, I don't understand why this didn't work better. And so I, I said to Coach, I said, uh, you know, now that the practice is over, I'd like to talk to him one more time. Coach said, I'm really not sure that's a great idea. And he said, no, I'd really like to talk to him just one more time. And he got in there and he said, guys, I love what you did. And, and we're Houston Astros and da-da-da-da-da. And, and we're a team and we're one and we're da And he said, Mark? Brick wall. They didn't give a rip what I was saying. So I just finished it and went back and thought, man, I've lost the ability to give a motivational speech. And he said, and the coach came up to me and he said something that I've never forgotten. I said, what was that, Drayton? He said, he told me that I was making a big mistake because I was assuming baseball was a team sport. He said, baseball is an individual sport that's played on a team. He said, if the pitcher can keep his ERA down to 2.11, he's going to win the Cy Young. He's going to get his big contract. He's on his way to the Hall of Fame. Doesn't matter if the team loses every game that he doesn't pitch. If the batter's going to average 300 as a batting average, he's headed to the Hall of Fame. Doesn't matter what the rest of the team does. His contract, his pay, his trade value is all based on his individual performance, not the team performance. Baseball is an individual sport that's played on a team. It's not a team sport like basketball. Okay, Paul's talking about a team sport here, not an individual sport. Paul's saying we need to contend together. We need to fight together. We need to look out for each other. The men's group is important because you'll make a better network of men that'll look out for you and you can look out for them than in this big room. 
The women's ministry is important because you'll make those connections and ties. Smaller connection groups that we've got are important because you'll make those connections. We've got to be people who strive side by side. That's the way the ESV does a marvelous job of translating that language. Striving side by side as a team working together. It's appropriate during the Olympics. Now, if you're panicked and saying, oh my heavens, he's taken that long on the first point, don't worry, the last two dots connect really quick. Next, connect the dot. So be a team player. Work side by side. And don't be frightened in anything by your opponents, the people you're against. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that's from God. Paul says, don't be frightened. Peturo is this is the only time I think in the Bible you'll find this, Old Testament or New, um, in the Greek Bible. Peturo uh, is don't let yourself be intimidated, but don't be frightened. If you look at the word in classical Greek, it's used a ton in referencing to horses who get spooked. When you, 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 if you've ever been around horses, you spook a horse. You cause a stampede of horses. But horses can get real spooked. Um, I decided one time I was going to be a horseman. Now, I, you're not going to find this. Uh, <clears throat> you, you're going to be shocked. But it, it doesn't come naturally to me. <laughs> I'm not per se the horse type. But I decided I wanted to be couple of young kids they need to be around horses so I called a buddy of mine I, I mean what do you how, where do you buy a horse I mean you don't just like go down to Sam's I'll take two of those I'm gonna buy in bulk um, so I go and I buy through a buddy of mine two horses he says what kind of horses you want I said I want horses that I can ride he says are you any good at riding I said, I'll tell you after we get them. He said, well, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And I said, not really. I said, but I want my kids to grow up around horses. I think this is an important thing. He said, okay, well, uh, all right. Um, then we need really tame, broken horses that are just like barely alive. And I said, I said, well, no, don't do that to me. I said, I'm young. I've got energy. I'll be fine. Just give me some good horses. And he said, okay, so I buy these two horses not having a clue. I mean, I've got to read how to feed them. Okay, I don't, I don't have a clue. I'm not quite sure how to put the saddle on. But that's got straps and stuff. It, you kind of figure it out. I thought it'd come with an instruction manual. It doesn't. They just assume if you're buying one, you know how to put it on. You got to put that thing in their mouth. They're not real liking on that, by the way. So I've got these horses. Well, before I can put the kids on them, i got to try them out. Well, there used to be a restaurant about half a mile away as the car drives called the County Line Restaurant. It was barbecue, and it was good. And I thought, well, I'm calling my buddy Chip up. Chip, yeah, I think we need to saddle up these horses and ride and get some barbecue. And he says, are you serious? And I said, yes, come on. Now, Chip was an Eagle Scout. So I figure he probably got his little horsey badge. And he should know how to do this. Well, it turns out Chip doesn't know anything about horses either. And, and he's from Kentucky. He has no excuse. So, so I mean, he's, he's like, give me a mint julep and I'll watch the race. But I don't know how to saddle him. So, so Chip comes over and I say, come on. So we go out there. Well, we spend an hour, hour and a half trying to figure out how to get these saddles on, how to get the bit and the bridle on and all the rest of this stuff. And the horses quickly identify that we don't have a clue what we're doing and they have no reason to obey us there's not like oh he's gonna spur me they know I don't know what a spur is so we get them saddled up we get on the horses they don't want to move they're like we have food here why would we want to walk all the way over to the county line for you to eat 
And so we're like, no, come on. So we finally get them. We get them. We're on, we're on the street. We get them out to the county line. They didn't want to cross the railroad tracks. That's another story. But we get them to the county line, and we tie them up on a tree. Uh, not on a tree. Yeah, to a tree, I think, would be the right preposition. We tie them up to a tree, and we go inside. Well, we quickly said, can we have a window seat? Because we got to keep an eye on our vehicle. <laughs> our two horses. So we're sitting there, we're eating the barbecue, and we look out the window, and our horses are not tied up to the tree anymore. <laughs> we go, and we, <laughs> we go, here, horsey, 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 <laughs> because the horses are loose. And this is not a good scene, okay? Please understand, I have handled a lawsuit before where someone let their cow out in the middle of the road and gets pie-odd, and it, like, hurts people. So I, I'm thinking like a lawyer here, oh, my heavens, my horsies are loose. This is not a good thing. And they're going to say, well, Mark, did you tie him up right? Well, I don't know. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Um, okay, so this is like lawsuit city ready to happen. So I'm like, okay, Chip. We've got to get these horses. And so you go around that way. I'll go around this way, and we'll get the horses. So, so Chip says, got it. So Chip's going around this way. Well, every time he'd take a step toward the horse, the horse would scoot over there. And I'm coming around this way, and I'd take a step, and the horse would scoot over there. And, I'd, and, so, <laughs> and we'd both kind of get, well, that horse is, knows exactly what we're doing, and it's no more going to come than the man in the moon. So at which point I just said to Chip, Chip, I don't know what we're going to do. Chip said, we're going to have to just rush them. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we paturoed the horses. We frightened them. We startled them. We spooked them. And they took off like Bam! Running. And we're running after those horses as fast as we can. We got no shot at getting them. They are just be. And, and I'm like, well, I'm, what, are, what are we doing? We are running down Cutting Road chasing two horses who've got their reins just dragging on the road behind them as they glum, glum, glum. And of course, they were headed straight to the barn or whatever I called a barn. They were headed straight back to where their free food was. And, uh, uh, and we show up about 15 minutes after them huffing and puffing. You don't want to startle a horse. Horses startle. That's the word that Paul's using here. Paul says, don't be startled like a horse. Don't be afraid of your opponents. Don't fear them. The believer should live with uncommon boldness in the face of this life. If you are a cat person, be proud right now. If you are a dog person, be ashamed. <laughs> but the believer should have an uncommon boldness in life. Hey, look at this. Don't be spooked. Don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign. Um, Indexus is the word that Paul uses here for sign. It's not his normal word of semia, but, but it's, um, uh, 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 it, it means even an omen of sorts. But, but it's, it's um, uh, you know, there. He says, this is a clear sign, an omen to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. Soterios is the, the form there of soteria, which means salvation, but it also carries with it an idea of deliverance and, and preservation. Paul, scholars debate, is he looking long-term here, eschatologically? Is he looking for our salvation at the end of, of the, the show? Or is he talking about deliverance today? And I think Paul lives with both in views. He's always got the end result in mind. But he recognizes that God also rescues us constantly here in this world today. 
Uh, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 18, and it, it's one that, that we grew up in our youth group singing a song. And I'm just going to take a poll and ask you if you sang this song. Our song came from verse 3 and verse 46. Verse 3 starts out, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Did anybody sing that song? And do you remember the, the, the chorus in it? came from verse 46. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and may the God of my salvation be exalted. That's the way we sang it. God is a God of that in the Greek version, soteria is the word that's being used here. God's a God of salvation in the here and now, not just in the, in the far distant future. God sustains us in the midst of this life and all that it travails. Now, we have connected two of the dots. Olympics, horses, now to suffering. Paul ends this passage with this. Because it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You saw that I had because when Paul was in Philippi he basically got run out of town for the sake of the gospel. But before he got run out of town, he got in, in, imprisoned. He got put in jail for disturbing the peace, if you will, casting a demon out of a servant girl. So he gets put into jail. That's not, that, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. And, and it was for the Philippian jailer and his family because they met the Lord that way. Paul suffered for the sake of Christ, truly. And while th that doesn't seem like a good thing to us, for Paul, it was an honor. Look, Paul had a weird view of things that I got to be candid with you. I have difficulty sharing. But I want to learn to. See, this right here, it has been granted, Euchariste. It has been granted, Euchariste is from the verb charizomai. It means to give graciously. But it was a common term in places like Philippi for how people were honored for their civic duty. How officials would get honored. They would be given an honor. You know, it's like um, if we, we give the keys to the city or something to someone or the mayor can. Or we can, uh, we can have today proclaimed as National Turkey Corn Dog Day or whatever it may need to be. I love turkey corn dogs. I had them for breakfast. That's the first thing that came into mind. I'm sorry. Um, but, but whatever it may be, we give honor an homage, an, an awards. Okay, that's language that, that was used here. Charizomai is, is a word that was used commonly in that, and it fits in great with Paul's theme of living like a citizen in the kingdom of God. A living responsibly in that way. In one spirit, one mind, working side by side, not being spooked, are frightened. This, this is, this is, but, but look how bizarre that is. It's been granted. It's been graciously given. I don't like to suffer. I don't want to suffer. I want to flee suffering. I want an easy cushy cush life. I want things to flow smoothingly. I don't want to get sick. I don't want my family and my loved ones to get sick. Our two little twins have been in, uh, they're our granddaughters, but we like to think of them as our own. 
Um, her daughter Rebecca said, Gracie's got two of them. Can she not just give one to me? Um, you know, they, we, we personalize this, but they've been in the hospital um, with the RSV. They'll be fine. A lot of people praying for them. Thank you for those prayers. Um, but, but I don't want people to suffer. I don't want people to die prematurely. I don't want any of that kind of stuff. And, I don't, I, I, and, and, and God doesn't, didn't make this world to be that way. And God says he's going to, to wipe this world out and create a new world where it won't be that way. But I'd like that to be here now. Don't get me wrong, I don't want him to wipe this out yet. But I just don't look at suffering the way Paul did. And I'm, I'm trying to learn. But this just really slapped me in the face when I was translating it. It's been graciously given to you that for the sake of Christ, you not only believe in him, but you get to suffer for him, for his sake. See, yeah, but he would be glorified a lot more if there wasn't suffering. Well, and he will get that glory one day because he will eliminate suffering and there will be no tears. But we're not there yet. We're still in the war zone and we're still fighting and we're striving and fighting side by side. And that's where we are. See, Paul just saw the world differently. And, and it's not just in the immediate, but it was also his long view. He knew what our destiny was. See, we as believers know this is not the end. We as believers know this world in this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. The Greek word thlipsis for tribulation. It's, it's like being pulled. Uh, a, a, a graphic description of that Greek word, in the world you will have tribulation, is, is something like this. Take a rope and put a rope right here. Okay? Okay? And then take another rope. Here, we'll do the other rope in a uh, different color. And do another rope right here. So you've got two ropes. Pull this rope this way. Pull this rope this way. And what happens to the stuff in the middle? Yeah, this is squeezed. This is philipsis in the Greek. This is getting squeezed. This is tribulation. This is what it feels like. It's a very graphic word. This is what it feels like. In this world, you're getting squeezed. You're getting pulled in different directions. You're getting punched in the gut. Jesus says, but be of good cheer because I've overcome this world. Well, okay, but right now I'm getting punched in the gut. But Paul's got that long view. And I've got to learn to get it because I don't have it yet. But I'm connecting the dots and I'm trying. Okay. Points to ponder. Watch the Olympics if you want to, but live the Olympics. Live united. Make a conscientious effort to be someone who when people bring up your name, they say, oh, that's someone who loves across boundaries. Because we're going to stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I'm going to figure out how to help and support you to the best of my abilities. I hope you'll figure out how to do the same to me. I get notes of encouragement from you guys all the time. Prayers of encouragement all the time. It means the world to me. I want you to know I pray for you. That I work hard to, to bring a lesson that I hope will help transform your life. Because I want to strive with you side by side. And as we do that, I want to urge you to have uncommon boldness. Be the cat, not the horse. Don't be frightened in anything. Because we've got a God who's bigger than everything. And on suffering, let's 
work to take the long view. It's been granted to us to suffer for the sake of Christ. Christ suffered. And if we suffer in this world and we are suffering, let it be for the sake of Christ. Let it be, uh, let the world know that our confidence and our uncommon boldness is in the Lord and we are not fearful because the one who died for us is now living within us. And the life that we lived in the flesh, we're going to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that can give us that longer view. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. So with that, it's time for church. Let me bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to do that within us. To unite us in your spirit as one people known by the world for our love. And Father, would you please, please, please take us and give us an uncommon boldness to walk in this world confident when we follow you, we're going exactly where we need to go. And may we flee to you not just when the skies are stormy, but when the sun is out. May we embrace you. May we walk with you. May we be yours. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.